Three, two, one. Roll the footage. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Strategy Show. I'm your host, Simon Severino. Today, we have marketing guru, author of 3,500 blog posts in a time where they were not yet called blog posts, author of six books, duct tape marketing, duct tape selling, the commitment engine, SEO for growth, the referral engine, and his latest one, the self-reliant entrepreneur, 366 daily meditations to feed your soul and grow your business. Welcome, everybody. John Jench. Hey, thanks, Simon. So excited to have you here because this is so relevant. Marketing is right now so relevant. Your definition of marketing, if it's still uh, uh, how I, I how I remember it, is is to get people who have a need to know you, to like you, and to trust you. Absolutely still relevant uh, today. I wrote that, uh, gosh, 15 years ago, I think, uh, in uh, some of the original uh, work leading up to uh, the book, Duct Tape Marketing. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's, I think maybe in some ways it's become even more relevant. That's that's uh, really, I think, what's nice about that idea. In fact, with all the, you know, all the new platforms, all the new technology, everything that everybody talks about, how marketing's changed, you know, I think fundamentally we're we're doing the same thing. You know, we're getting people who have a need to know, like, and trust us. They just have different ways to, to come about uh, that decision. Uh, but I don't think our job as marketers has changed at all. Why did you write your last book? After so many books and yeah. such a career, why are you still writing books? Why did you write The Self-Reliant Entrepreneur? Well, my my publisher might say because you know they want me to keep writing books is why I keep writing books. But but uh, you're you're absolutely right. I mean, my first uh, five books uh, were very squarely about some aspect of marketing. Uh, the self reliant entrepreneur is not you know it's not a how to do anything. It's really more of a why to, um, and it's something that's that I that I can say that maybe in some ways I I have been working on for thirty years. I mean, it's kind of a a collection of my thoughts about uh, being an entrepreneur, what it takes. Um, you know the the level of trust it takes, the level of resilience. You know the role of failure. You know what success means, and so I uh, I pretty much wrote it in uh, 366 uh, entries, which uh, for those of you keeping score, that's you know that's one entry a day, and uh, so it is a kind of a calendar uh, type of book, and I think it fits a uh, um, you know I I personally have had a a morning ritual kind of practice to get myself ready for the day and I go through some things I journal I meditate I you know think about what I'm going to try to accomplish my most important things I'm going to try to accomplish and so you know having something that is effectively inspirational read of of 90 seconds or 2 minutes or something um, you know just fit kind of into my practice and so I actually do use I do use my own book daily uh, in you know in that kind of practice and that's so I just wanted to write something very different um, and and you know kind of share my not only my writing but just maybe my thinking and, and beliefs uh, in a way to support uh, other entrepreneurs. So this is something people can pick up in the morning, be inspired quickly, and have a good start of their day. Yeah, that's the idea. In fact, uh, if you want, we could read today's because it takes 90 seconds. <laughs> or yeah. so. Um, I have to think about what today is. Uh, September 30th, the last day of September. At least it is uh, uh, for me. I don't know if it, some of your listeners have already yeah. tur turned over <laughs> to uh, October 1st. But uh, so so um, the idea is every day has a title of some, some idea. Um, and then I actually um, anchored all of the days in some reading or writing from the mid-19th century. So a lot of authors, that, at least Americans, uh, were, were asked to read in, in school, Emerson and Thoreau and uh, Louise May Alcott. Um, and it's, uh, um, I, again, I think it's some of the, some of the first sort of countercultural uh, writing in, in America. Um, and I think it applies to entrepreneurs still today, 150 years later. And then I give 100 words or so myself and then, and then give you a question uh, every day. So you want me to read today's, Simone? Yes. All right. So today's title happens to be... Um, failure's message. However mean your life is, meet it and live it. Do not shun it and call it hard names. It is not so bad as you are. It looks poorest when you are richest. The fault finder will find faults 
even in paradise. Love your life, poor as it is. You may perhaps have some pleasant, thrilling, glorious hours, even in a poor house. The setting sun is reflected from the window of the almshouse as brightly as from the rich man's abode. The snow melts before its door as early in the spring. I do not see a quiet mind may live as contentedly there and have as a cheering thoughts as in a palace. And that's uh, from Henry David Thoreau's uh, classic work, uh, Walden, which was written in 1854. So then I give kind of my reflection on it. <clears throat> Let's face it, at some point, everybody gets knocked down. Things don't always go as planned, but it's how you handle adversity that will become the ultimate expression of your success. There are only so many things you have control over. And number one on that list is how you think and feel about daily events. We can't control the weather, what others say about us, or whether or when someone decides to rip our ideas off as their own. We can't control failure or paradise. We can only decide what we want to learn from it. And the lessons are countless. In some cases, what we see as failure is a mistake or error in judgment on our part coming home to roost. Or it could just be something we weren't quite ready to pull off in precisely the manner we chose. But either way, there's a lesson if we wish to accept it. The fantastic thing about growing as an entrepreneur is that you either flame out uh, through resistance to things like change and failure and, oh, hard work, or you learn to accept that all is as it should be. The key is to love the setting sun from where you are right now, or you'll always find it hard to love the setting sun, no matter how high you soar by some other person's gauge of your success. So Such a powerful start. <laughs> so much better than reading emails. <laughs> yeah, no so much better than just going on autopilot into the first task of the day. Beautiful. So then I end every day with a question. And so the, the question for today was, who is one entrepreneur that you deeply admire? Why? Mm. So I know that we'll probably get to the answer to that in one of your uh, one of your questions that I know you have routinely during the show. So I'll get I'll get to answer that question. What a segue into the Strategy Awards. Who is one entrepreneur you admire? So I have for a long time, and I would consider him a mentor. I don't know if he would consider himself uh, that my mentor, but uh, uh, Seth Godin has been somebody that has been a, a friend. He has been, uh, he, he wrote on the back of the self-entrepreneur uh, a daily workbook designed to challenge you to focus on the hard part, finding work that matters. John's prompts are a masterwork. Seth Godin, author of This Is Marketing. Um, and, and part of the reason, I, I think many, many people that would be on this show, that would listen to this show, would, would count Seth as, as somebody that, that they admire. I think one of the things that, that for me, came up when you said the Strategy Award is he has, uh, he has remained relevant, so incredibly relevant for 30 years um, and still today um, is, is remaking himself and changing, you know, how he shows up and changing the format of his products and services and books and shows. And um, I just think that, uh, you know, that that is to me is is very uh, admirable. Absolutely. He's he's one of my heroes, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he, he always says you can have mentors and you can have heroes, but mentors are hard, hard to get and usually they're busy and you don't get sure, it. But sure. hero, you can have a hero all the time. You can think what would my hero do all the time. So get a hero. <laughs> yeah, I like it. I like it. Although I will say that, you know, I count as my one of my mentors is Peter Drucker. Well, he was um, he was. Before I went into business, he was long gone. Um, but I just I'm so inspired by his works, and his works have definitely developed my thinking on strategy and and on marketing. Um, even though you know I never met him, and I, I think that's one of the beauties of um, of works uh, written works that uh, that that they can leave a legacy and and really inspire you know generations of people. I I like your books because they are still relevant. They are evergreen. Uh, they are applicable, but especially uh, also 15 years later, your definitions are still relevant and yeah. they are very, very much used. Not always people say that they have them from you, but yeah. you see them everywhere. <laughs> yep. And, and uh, I am so curious because as somebody who has decided just last week that I will write my first book and wow. I wrote the first chapter yesterday and I'm a little bit proud of it. Nice. <laughs> and... Uh, from that perspective, but also from the perspective of 
channeling uh, our community of people who is thinking, hmm, should I write a book? Yeah. Uh, maybe collect all my blog posts and do something bigger. Uh, you, you have written six books. Yeah. Why writing books and how to write them? Sure, sure. So, I mean, there are many reasons, very, very valid reasons for people in business, uh, particularly uh, to, to write books. I mean, that you know, even a book that doesn't you know sell wildly, um, you know, is still a tremendous tool to differentiate you from other people that are doing consulting or whatever it is that you do. Um, it's certainly a great way to uh, to you know to be seen as an expert. You know, whether or not you're any smarter than anybody else, the tangible you know book uh, does does add that. Um, but I think particularly if you have if you have something to say um, and you are capable of saying it in ways that that help people make transformation, you know, you're probably going to sell a few of those books. I mean, I in my particular case, you know, duct tape marketing was in a lot of ways a distillation of the work I had been doing for a number of years. Um, but it allowed me to really take my brand to to places, um, you know, globally. I mean, I was essentially when I was writing duct tape marketing, I was essentially a local marketing consultant working with small businesses, uh, still where my heart is. And I love doing that. Uh, but I in, in immediately had, um, you know, a global presence. Now, duct tape marketing has been translated into 15 or 16 languages. Uh, so, you know, it, it made my speaking career take off. It certainly, you know, it certainly allowed allowed me to charge a lot more money, you know, for, for the consulting fees, because, you know, for whatever reason, people wanted to work with the, the sort of known uh, expert uh, in the field. So it can do a lot of great things for your business on a, you know, a small scale or on a very large scale. And, and how is it possible that your first book was a good book? Because usually the first one should be the, 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 the not so good book, right? And <laughs> over, over the years you evolve. Yeah, I think the difference is a lot of authors, even business authors, you know, get an idea, they do some research, they write the book. I had been living you know, what I wrote about, you know, for about 10 years. I mean, all I did was write, here's here's some stuff we tried, seemed to work, <laughs> you know, you might try it too. Um, and I think that that, um, I think that comes off as, uh, it certainly came off as much more practical <laughs> than a lot of books because I was telling other people, you know, who were working with or wanted to work with small business owners exactly how to do it. So it was, uh, it was certainly very practical in that sense, but I think it also, uh, allowed it to be useful. I won't, you know, I won't necessarily claim that the writing was the best prose, or uh, that that other people in other people's hands couldn't have written something that was more uh, uh, elegant. Uh, but it certainly did the trick in terms of explaining uh, to people how to do something that they didn't know how to do. The next question that uh, our community has is: Should I self-publish or should I go to a publisher? Sure. Yeah. And uh, also, people like Seth Godin. Uh, ha have been talking about this, that at the end, the publisher will not do the marketing work for you. <laughs> yeah. At the end, you still have to do it. Yeah. Uh, what's your take on it? Well, I, I, I think, again, it probably starts with what your goals are. Yeah. Um, you know, there are very, very many reasons to have a book as a, as a marketing tool, as a tool to tell your story. Um, and and if that's its primary purpose, then you can you can very easily self-publish a very nice book uh, today. There are you know lots of, of tools, lots of resources, lots of service providers out there that can help you get that done. Um, and and if the book does happen to sell well, you're going to make a lot more money <laughs> you know, off of that because you know a traditional publishing deal, uh, you know the the author there are all kinds of different ways that contracts are structured, but the author traditionally gets about 15% of a hardback and less than that you know of a paperback. Uh, so if you think about that, you know. Uh, you, know, you got to sell about ten thousand copies to you know to make it to make it you know a couple months worth of rent <laughs> you know so that's that's a lot of copies but now if if you self publish you know you flip that around you're getting about eighty percent probably or or more depending upon how uh, how you do it and so uh, from a just pure sales standpoint it can be much more lucrative to to self publish. Uh, you know, the real value of having a, a traditional pub, traditionally published book is that there is a little more cachet with it. I mean, people look at that and say, oh, that was Wiley or that was Harper or, you know, that was Penguin. 
And certainly in some circles that holds um, a lot of weight. You also get the distribution uh, that comes from, you know, when back when people used to go to bookstores um, and, and airports and places like that, you know, those books are, are going to uh, almost automatically put into those places. I think that's actually become less of an issue because I don't know what the percentage is, but you know, Amazon probably has about 70% of the book sale market now, and, and any self-published book can be on Amazon as long as you follow their, uh, their process. So um, if, if, you know, if what's holding you back from getting your book out there is you can't get the attention of any publishers, which has gotten harder to do, um, then, then self-publish for sure. And you are even writing the next one. What's that about? <laughs> I am. Um, at one point, I was thinking, gosh, I've written, I wrote Duct Tape Marketing uh, in 2007. I've actually updated it in 2012. Um, but I, I really was starting to think, gosh, I've continued to do this work. You know, I've evolved, marketing's evolved. You know, should I rewrite Duct Tape Marketing? So I went to um, Harper Leadership, who is uh, the publisher of, of that book. Um, and they said, you know, right now, what, what we want is a book on uh, that, that is going to be a shorter book that is going to be very focused on strategy. So I'm writing a book that is uh, um, tentatively been named The Ultimate Marketing Engine. Um, and it is going to be um, my very granular distillation of how to actually think about marketing from the customer's point of view and not from the business's point of view. And um, so that, uh, you know, without, without even though I will be revealing lots of it, it's not going to be out until uh, the fall of 2022, 20, uh, depending upon when you're listening to this. So there's still a, a great deal that I'm working on, but that's going to be the primary focus is that if we think about um, what our customers um, need to be successful and we build our entire business around getting uh, that uh, objective achieved um, and maybe narrowing our focus uh, in marketing, you know, that's, that's essentially that's uh, in 50 words or less. That's the, uh, that's the concept of the book. To get it out there distributed, people still need to build an audience. What's yeah. your take in Funky 2020 on building an audience? Well, I don't think it's changed that much other than it's just gotten more crowded. <laughs> you know, everybody wants to build an audience, right? And so there's so many, only so many audience members and then only so much time that those audience members have to be a part of the audience. So what I think has happened now is, is you know, the value you deliver to your community, how you take care of them, how they are able to get what they need, even if that what they need is meeting other people like them, um, that, you know, is is probably gotten much harder to do uh, just because there's so much more competition. So finding a smaller audience and taking care of them um, is a much, uh, probably a much more practical approach than saying, you know, I want to be like XYZ person that I see out there with millions of, of fans and followers. You know, if that happens, that happens. But um, I think the sure way to uh, success, quite frankly, is find a thousand people who think what you do is amazing. One book that inspired you recently? Uh, recently? Um, you know, I've, I, I get so many books here because, as you know, uh, you were a guest on my podcast. I do a lot of podcasts, so I get a lot of books. And I would say that inspired me is um, a, a good friend of mine, Mike Michalowicz, has written a, a series of books. Uh, his most recent book is called Fix This Next. Um, and I, uh, um, I've, you know, I've been going through that. I did have him on my show as well, uh, but I think he's done a great job of kind of showing the progression. You know, the obvious idea behind fix this next is, is you know, figure out where you are, and then here's the next logical step. You know, all the way through, you know, legacy uh, and impact. And um, so I think it's, uh, I think it's a very timely read, maybe for me as I'm, I'm starting to think, you know, what, uh, what my next career will be someday. Super important because. In this year, we're so so feel so so many moving parts, yeah. and people might be overwhelmed by, oh, I could do this, I could do that, I could do uh, the next thing, and if if you know what to fix next and just solve that one bottleneck, that can yeah. maybe yeah. help you have more clarity on your next steps. You yeah, and I think a lot of businesses, big and small, you know, are just their their primary focus is revenue, um, and I think that you know, if a total focus on revenue. Um, you know, 
in some cases gets you in trouble, you know, because if you're not also focused on profit, you're not also focused on purpose, um, then you know you're 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 doing things just for the sake of of generating more business, which maybe generates more expense, more headaches, more stress, and not necessarily allowing you to serve your purpose. So I, I think you've got to take in that whole picture. What did you recently change your mind about? Huh. What did I recently change my mind about that? Um, <sighs> That's a hard question. Do you ask everybody that question? Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say that I would say that I've, I, I've recently changed my mind or changed at least my attitude about um, paid advertising, uh, paid search uh, in, in, in particular. And, and, Primarily because um, you know Google controls the game and in a lot of ways, and Google controls the space and Google controls the audience, and so I've really been pushing a lot of folks towards uh, Google advertising. In a lot of ways, I mean, it's always been fairly effective, but in a lot of ways, um, it's almost you, you almost have to uh, participate in it uh, to you know to play the game. I mean, the, the the behavior of the buyer now is is so attuned. To uh, to the presence uh, and relevance of Google Ads, uh, for example, that you know if you're not playing there, uh, you're just missing an, a, a large percentage of the audience. But of course, you've got to do it um, uh, in a very smart way because you can also waste a lot of money that way. And this is so timely. Yesterday, Strategy Sprints, our company, and Google had together a press conference on small businesses and how to help them right now in in this year mm. uh, in Zurich. And uh, Google started and showed some numbers uh, that um, online businesses are going up 33 percent yeah. during the recession. But especially, they showed that for small businesses, brick and mortar businesses, that even for every restaurant, for every business, the customer journey starts online. Oh yeah. So everybody first checks you up on the phone and That's then right. comes to you. If you are a librarian, if you if you are selling flowers, the customer journey starts online. What yeah, and, and I would say even you know even if somebody you know even if somebody called you up and said you know do you know anybody who can help us with X? I mean a referral. You know that used to just be okay. I'm going to call them up. Well, no, we we go and we look at their website. We see what else other people are saying about them. We check them out on LinkedIn. So no question. Absolutely, this is so relevant. One thing, also one of your models that became worldwide uh, normal usage is that the funnel is not really a funnel. It's more of an hourglass. Can you unpack that a little bit? Yeah. So uh, just as you said, I mean, the funnel shape has been around forever. It's, you know, send your world message out there to the world and then start funneling people down to where they want to buy from you. Um, and, and that, you know, that aspect of marketing, you know, is still relevant today. But what I um, was trying to address with the hourglass is, is that that's where a lot of people stop. It's like, okay, we got them to buy. <laughs> um, and my belief is that if you, that that's the place, that's the point at which um, the, the activity needs to expand again. Um, and, and so now how are you going to retain them and how are you going to turn them into advocates so that they become a lead generation source for you? So the seven stages, and we talked about my definition of marketing. So the seven stages are no like trust, try by repeat and refer. And that if businesses want to build a, a truly effective journey, they have to be thinking about what are the questions and objectives and, and ways in which I'm going to help guide people uh, intentionally through all seven of those stages, as opposed to how do I get the phone ring? How do I get them to click on my link? So powerful. Seven stages, people. Note that down, go through your own funnel, see where it is, and then remember to repeat the yeah. part that works. Repeat. And yeah, because it, it's, it's interesting. Over the years, the, the work, the, the companies that I have worked with um, that I've had the greatest amount of impact is that, that, that they were a good company. Uh, they had a good reputation. <laughs> um, they had good marketing. And so they were, you know, they, they had a nice lead flow. They had nice revenue. Um, we'd go to work on their conversion and on their, their customer experience. And those two elements immediately paid dividends, doubled and tripled the bottom line in some cases, uh, because um, those are areas that people just neglect. And, and th that's, you know, that's the part that gets people coming back. That's the part that gets people talking about how you exceeded their expectations. And uh, it, it, it sort of becomes a self-fulfilling 
uh, prophecy. I always say the best sor source of lead generation is a happy customer. Absolutely. And the cost of acquisition is already paid. So you have zero cost of acquisition in theory. And at the beginning of the hourglass or slash funnel, you, you have costs that yeah. you might not know by cent, etc. If you're a small company, you might sure. not know exactly what the costs are, but you have costs of acquiring every customer. Yeah. And um, yeah, what are what are things that you you ask yourself in this strange year? <laughs> well, I, I think my first reaction when, um, you know, we're going back six months ago, I think people have gotten a little bit used to it, of course, by now. But but six months ago, um, you know, I personally was asking, um, I mean, you know, like a lot of people, you know, what's going to happen, right? <laughs> you know, what what's going to happen to, you know, the world? What's going to happen to, you know, all these businesses? Um, and so, like a lot of people, there was a moment of, of sort of panic and shock. Uh, my my initial reaction and the advice I gave to all of my clients was, you know, now's the time to get even closer to your customers. Uh, figure out who your best customers are <laughs> um, and figure out how to, whatever it is that they love about you, figure out how to do it twice as well. Figure out how to do it, you know, in a much bigger way. Um, and I think that that um, it, certainly for my business, um, I saw the impact of that um, because I, I, I think the other side that it, it it revealed to me is that it's very easy as a business to get kind of lazy um, and take take your best customers, um, you know, for for you know, just assume that they're going to come back and, uh, and you know, we're going to stay happy um, and that you don't need to keep continue to resell them and reevaluate and, and redemonstrate uh, uh, your value. But I think the other thing that it showed is, is when you really focus on, gosh, I've got to make sure I keep my best customers happy. Um, it, for a lot of businesses, it reveals the 25 or 30 percent of the business that they do that they probably shouldn't be doing. You know, that that they're saying yes to, which is making it hard for them to, I mean, for for them to, you know, it, it effectively makes them say no to how can I serve my best customers. Um, and so I, I think in a lot of ways, it, it really reinforced this idea of, of narrowing my focus, but also figuring out how to get closer to my best customers as a way to, uh, to not only serve them and impact them. I mean, I, I, I'll be the first to admit, I mean, I was a little worried, you know, we were all going to lose everything, <laughs> you know, like a lot of people were. Um, but uh, what it really taught me was that, you know, that's where the real money is. Um, you know, regardless of the conditions, um, you know, figuring out who your best customers are and figuring out how to make them more successful um, is, is really all you need to do and stop chasing the next new, you know, thing. This is one thing that you said very early, and that is still so relevant how to say no and yeah. how to define who should not be the yeah. customer. Yeah. Uh, this week on the show was somebody and she told how they created a CRM software and then they had a click moment. And so, oh, this is exciting for investment managers. So then they said, OK, this is the CRM for investment managers. Right. And, and their team was but it will be a too small of a market. It's too narrow. A, we can't do that. So they did it. Yeah. Then they they rocked that market. Then they went adjacent markets, insurances, etc. Well, fast forward, they sold the company for 1.7 billion. Mm. So <laughs> if you think right now, okay, I know now my 40%, 50% ideal customer, but it might be too small of a market. Think twice because you can still, after you demonstrate that in a small market that you can do excellent work, you can still go adjacent markets and yeah. say, hey, did that with that, what about us? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, John, the question that I always ask at the end is, who should be my next guest? Well, um, I'm, I must admit, um, I have somebody that I think would make a great guest, but maybe you've had him on before. Um, I would say uh, Jay Bear would be a great uh, a guest. He's written uh, um, a couple books, uh, certainly uh, relating to marketing and, and customer service. Um, I don't know. Have you had Jay on the show before? Not yet. I'm excited. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think you should have him on the show. He's a, he's a, uh, he's a great speaker, great presenter, and uh, has some, uh, some great works. Absolutely. John, where can people stick around and uh, consume more of your knowledge? Sure. So pretty much everything I've done for the last couple of decades uh, can be found at ducttapemarketing.com. And that's D-U-C-T-T. 
T-A-P-E marketing.com. Thank you so much, John, for being on the show. And uh, yeah, please come back soon. All right. It was fun. Bye-bye.